framework. 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 Oh, chocolate? Oh, friend of well. Friend of well. Countdown commencing. T minus two minutes. Net data. T minus one minute. We are go for .NET data community stand-up. Yes, yeah, so we're go. Here we are again with another community stand-up. Uh, I'm joined by Jeremy and Shai uh, from the .NET data team. And uh, this week we're going to talk about uh, inheritance mapping. Um, so mapping a uh, object-oriented inheritance model to a relational database. Um, the reason we're bringing it up this week is because uh, new in uh, EF Core 7 Preview 5, which just went out yesterday, we have TCP, TPC mapping support, um, which is added to the TPH and TPT that we already had there. Um, so this is a good time to go back and kind of review all of those things and look at the pros and cons, look at the perf, you know, all of that, that stuff. Um, and... Uh, yeah, so that's going to be the majority of the show. I've got code to share. Um, Shai's got some benchmarks to show on stuff. Um, before we do that, let's just do the state of the unicorn. I haven't shared my screen, so let me do that. There we go. OK, so uh, what's going on? So basically, on NuGet, like I said, uh, EF7, which is what we're calling EF Core 7, uh, preview 5 was on NuGet yesterday, so you can go check that out. And the main thing that's included in there is TPC inheritance mapping. There are a couple of bugs uh, in the, the Preview 5 release. So um, getting the daily builds, um, which you can see all the instructions for on uh, on the uh, GitHub repo, uh, is the way to get you know any of the, the, the really latest bits uh, if you run into any issues there. Um, we are also have uh, at time zone support for SQL Server, which I don't really understand what that is. Um, Shai could maybe <laughs> explain in like two sentences what that is. Of course. So at time zone is a, is a construct in SQL, which allows you to apply time zone conversions. So if you have a local daytime, you want to transform it to UTC or vice versa, you can use that time zone. Um, that's about that's about what it is. Sounds good. 
Uh, we've got some improvements to command and connection interception. So there's uh, some additional events on there, um, some changing in the timing so that, for example, you can now use connection uh, interception without having to put a dummy connection string on. We don't check that connection string before uh, before we go into the interception, which makes it easier to use. And then we've got a, a community contribution from uh, Arta Pawoski for a delete behavior attribute that you can add to your entity types, your relationships, and determine whether they're going to get cascade deletes, uh, for example. Um, so that's really nice. At the same time, we're, we're still patching EF Core 6 um, with anything important you know, that gets, uh, gets filed. Um, the bar is somewhat high, but there's six uh, important fixes in there. Um, some of them, for example, to do with working better on ARM64 if you're going in that direction. Um, so, uh, also, um, just want to call out a couple of the interesting things that the team's currently working on. So, uh, Woodstar, which is the, the code name for our uh, attempt to create a modern high performance driver for SQL Server and Azure SQL. Um, then we've been kicking this around for a while now, but Smith is uh, now actively working on this, uh, doing all of the, 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 uh, T, T, what's the protocol? It's escaping me. Uh, the SQL Server TDS. protocol. Come on. TDS. Yes. I don't know. I'm, I'm losing my acronyms today. All of Tabular the TDS. Data base, silly. Yeah. <laughs> Tabular data stream, right? <laughs> um, yeah. Correct. And uh, it's all login stuff and complicated things. But yeah, that's good stuff. That's, that's really starting to get started now. And then Shai has been uh, doing lots of research and telling me lots of things about distributed transactions. And uh, currently in the plan for uh, .NET 7 is to try and get Windows support for the Windows uh, DTC, Distributed tra Transaction Coordinator, through uh, system.transactions so that people can port from .NET Framework um, to .NET Core on Windows applications. But Shai's also been doing lots of research into how we can eventually get a cross-platform support for distributed transactions. I doubt it will make it in 7, but, but we've, 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 Shai's getting some really good docs on that. And I think we're, we're seeing a way that it can happen if the demand is there and the priority is high enough. Um, there's definitely some uh, thoughts uh, in the community. If you're doing a microservice architecture, then perhaps not using traditional distributed transactions with uh, multi-phase commit is, is pot potentially not necessarily the best way to go. But then, you know, if a lot of customers are still doing it and, and maybe some of the new stuff in microservices isn't necessarily applicable to everyone, then we may do it anyway. So we'll probably uh, put some more stuff on GitHub on that fairly soon. And then uh, we'd appreciate your comments and feedback and letting us know. OK, so that's all of that stuff. Now let's let's get on to uh, TPT or TPC or TPH mapping. And what I'm going to do now is um, stop sharing this and share my other screen. Da -da, share screen, which would be this one. Add that to the stream. OK, so before we, this is, this obviously I've got code here. But before we go into that, I want to call out this blog post that was uh, put out there yesterday by Jeremy with some input from me as well on um, the announcement of Preview 5, of EF Core 7 Preview 5. Um, and this has uh, a fairly um, in-depth or fairly detailed discussion of inheritance mapping in general um, and TPT, TPC, and TPH specifically. We're going to go over some of the same content today, although we've got additional stuff to put in this. So we're going even deeper in these uh, in this session, which is you know what we like to do. Um, but before we go deeper in it, I just want to call out some of the stuff that's on this document because some of the tables here I think make it fairly easy to see the the basics of the strategies here. So going right back to the beginning, what is the problem we're trying to solve here? So the problem is that we're trying to solve is that very often uh, in an object-oriented programming environment, you create these hierarchies of uh, types. And I think this is fairly well known to everybody. So you can say, OK, we have animals, but then we can have a specialization of animals. We can say, well, some animals are 
as pets. And then we can have a specialization of pet and say, well, some pets are cats and dogs. And so in, in, in an object or in a language, you have this inheritance hierarchy, right? And it essentially forms this tree with a root type and then various branches like pet and then various leaves at the end of the tree. Um, very often the root types in these things, and sometimes, for example, sometimes the um, the some of the the, the branch types as well are abstract because you never actually want to create an instance of an animal. It's always something more specific that you create. Uh, and it could well be argued that uh, pet should be abstract in this case. And indeed it would be if there wasn't a bug in preview five that made that not work. Um, so if you get in the daily bills, you can easily make pet abstract, which kind of makes sense for this model. But it's also good to show that you can have concrete types that are in the middle of the hierarchy too, right? It, does, it doesn't It does have to be only your leaf types that are concrete types. Um, and it doesn't, we could make the animal type concrete too. You don't have to have an abstract type, but very often that's a, that's a way of modeling it. So this is what we've got, but the relational database doesn't have a concept unless you go into some weird stuff in Postgres, which is just very bizarre, which we're not going to go into because even Shai says it's not really a good idea to use. Basically, relational databases don't have this concept of inheritance built in. You're mapping things to tables, you know, to relational tables. Um, and that doesn't represent inheritance. And so you've got to do some mechanism that lets you get two pieces of information into the relational database. Um, you've got to store in the relational database what type the thing actually is. So is it a farm animal? Is it a cat? Is it a dog? Because um, just knowing that it's an animal doesn't help. You, we, we need to know what the type is. And then because these things have different different uh, properties, so like cats, you know, are generally quite educated, um, <laughs> whereas dogs generally just like to play with their toys. And so cats here have an education level and dogs have a favorite toy. And so we need to store cats educational level and dogs favorite toys in the database and get that back appropriately depending on whether the thing we're getting out is a cat or a dog right because we can't get out a favorite well an education level for a dog and then try and store it in there because there's no property for it so we've got to store both the type and then what the actual data is um, that's specific to that type okay so that's the basic problem that, that we're we're trying to do the easiest way to do this and the default in uh, in EF core is called the TPH strategy. TPH stands for table per hierarchy because what we're going to do is we're going to create one single table for all of the types. So it doesn't matter how many of these types there are, there'll just be one table. Um, so here in this example, uh, and we can show this in code in a minute, um, in this example, we've got an animals table, and then we've got properties in here for every possible attribute, every possible, we've got, sorry, columns in here for every possible property that there might be on an animal. So we've got a favorite toy and an education level property. Now, if it's a, if it's a cat, it's not going to have a favorite toy. And if it's a dog, it's not going to have an education level, right? So some of these are redundant for the particular row. Uh, and that's very clear when you see uh, some data saved in here, for example. So we've got we've got two cats and a dog saved in here. And if you look for educational level, both the cats have their uh, content filled in, but the dog is null. And likewise, uh, for the dog, for the cats, the favorite toy is null and the only the favorite toy is filled in. So two important things to notice from here. All these columns need to be nullable. Right. If you've got a if you've got a property that is in some subtypes but not in all, then the column needs to be nullable because um, and you can see that in the DDL here that we create an education saying that's nullable and favorite toy is nullable. And that's because if you're saving something that isn't of the type that has that property, we've got to put something in the database for it, and that is basically null. Um, that's not the case if you have a property that is uh, on the base type and therefore is required for everything. Uh, whether or not this is good modeling, we're not going to get into. But the species property here is not null because everything has a species. Every, every animal, every object that we create of any subtype of animal will have a species. So it cannot be created not null. Um, 
So uh, that's one thing. Uh, before I go on to the next thing, I do want to point out a, a, a something that, that trips people up or confuses people, and that is they don't expect that if the educational level of a cat, for example, is a required thing, that the column will be nullable in the database, but it has to be for the mapping strategy. Now, there's a way that you could create a constraint that says only allow it to be null if the discriminator is uh, one of the things that uh, doesn't have this property or or the inverse of that. So basically, we could create a database constraint that would be a more uh, specific stopping it being null when it shouldn't be null. We don't do that automatically in the EFCOR. There's an issue. If you think it's something we should do automatically, then you can go vote on it. Um, we do support creating constraints. So you can write these constraints manually and have EF create them in migrations. Um, but usually, this isn't too much of a problem, I don't think, um, especially if you're using an ORM like EF to access your data. It's pretty much going to make sure that you don't save the wrong data in there and make it uh, make it null when it shouldn't be, um, for example. So, um, it's, But if you want that extra protection, you can do it. OK, so the second point about this is this table is pretty wide, right? Because the, every subtype in this table Every property gets added to the column, added to the width of the table, right? The, there's a column for every property in every subtype. So if you have a lot of subtypes with a lot of properties, this can be a very wide table. Um, and that can be problematic. Furthermore, a lot of the values of those might be null. Like if we've only got one farm animal in here, right, then the value column is value row for all of the others. The value column for all of the other rows is going to be null. And so they can be very sparsely populated columns in here, which we will get to in a second. Um, and then the last thing to notice about this is how we actually determine what the type is. And it's actually really simple. There's a column called discriminator. And we put a value in that column that lets us know what the C sharp type is. By default, um, EF creates a string column and puts the name of the type in there. You can configure this. You can make it an int and just be one, two, three, whatever. You can make it an enum. You can do all those things. Um, but basically, when we're writing a query against this, we can just say, if we only want cats, then just filter by anything that's cat. If we only want dogs, filter by anything that's dogs. If we want both, then filter by dogs and cats. So, so that's the TPH mapping. Um, feel free to jump in, guys, if there's like questions or anything that we should cover before we, we go on. No questions. Nope. Okay. I guess the only the only thing is you, you already alluded to this, but the, the nice the appeal of this is that it's very simple uh, in yes. the database. You just have one table. It's very simple for you you users to understand. If you're looking at your database, you just have a single database, right? A single table, sorry. And it's also very simple for the database to perform queries on it, yes. uh, or for EF Core to perform queries, which leads right. us to the next. Next yes, so we are this. going. I, I am. We're going to go back and I'm going to show code and we're going to look at the queries. But that's a very important point. The queries for TPH are simple and they generally perform very well. Um, so uh, that's one of. There's a reason why this is the default, right? Because it works in a lot of cases. It's the best strategy in a lot of cases. Um, okay, but we'll come back to that in a minute. Now TPT is um, a little bit. Bryce says, should I be worried about all those nulls in my database? Well, we are, we're going to come back to that. We'll get to that. Um, <laughs> and uh, the answer is usually no, by the way, but there are ways you can mitigate that as well. Um, so TPT strategy is kind of the opposite of TPH. TPH, we, we created one table for the entire hierarchy. In TPT, we're creating a table for every type. So you can see here that we've created a table for animals, which is the base type. Even though it's abstract, it's still a type in the hierarchy. We've created a table for it. We've created a table for farm animals, pets, cats, and dogs. OK, so we've got actually five tables here. Um, this is a very normalized form, right? This, 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 this form is something that DBAs like a lot because it looks clean to them when they're looking at the database. There's no duplication. There's no, there's nothing in here where you have to store no the nulls in yeah. in the in the column because it's of the wrong type. Um, because notice that species only appears in the animals table. It doesn't appear in any of the other tables, right? It's there because. Anything that is an animal will have a row in the species in the animals table, and its species will be stored in there. Um, likewise, the 
when we go down to the cats and dogs educational level it's only in cats and favorite toy is only in dogs so it you'll only be a row in dogs table if your entity actually is a dog and it will only have a favorite toy value if it is a dog right so this is the very normalized form right it's very it's very clean in that respect um and the way these tables are linked together is that the because there's a always a row in the base table when using TPT for any animal has a row in the base table. This is where basically the primary key is managed. And then everything else is a foreign key constraint. Every other primary key is a foreign key constraint linked to the primary key table. So basically you can, you'll have a single ID for any animal and then it, it's used across all of these tables so it's consistent uh, and this this actually we'll come back to this again later but this makes it easy for generating keys as well okay um, looking at the data you can see that when we save instead of there being you know this one table with all the data in it being quite wide there's a lot of narrow tables and there's no null values here um, because every you don't have the value in the table if it's don't have the value stored in the database unless it actually exists for that type. But <clears throat> there's a lot of tables here. So if I want to do a query for all these things, I very often will have to join all of these tables together, right? So and joins are slow. And so this is the primary problem with TPT is because you've spread the information out across so many tables, in order to bring it back together, you have to do joins on those tables and that's slow. Um, so when we come, we'll come back to that again when we look at the queries, but that's just the primary problem with TPT, even though it looks nice and it's normalized, it's slow because you have to join stuff together. To some oh. degree, it's also slow when you insert or update data because you have to spread it out across things as code. But, most applications, the query performance, I think, is more significant than the, the insert update, right, Chai? Sure. Yeah, I, it's very, very important that updates also get very, very, like, relatively slow here, as you just said. Um, one more thing I wanted to add. So one reason why people sometimes choose TPT, as Arthur said, is because DBAs like it. And sometimes the database schema is, is like, given to us as developers from the outside. Uh, for for example, uh, from a DBA, but sometimes also developers like this a lot. A lot of beginners to to ORMs and to um, you know to ORM mapping strategies really like this because it's very simple to grok. The thing that you have in C Sharp is the thing that you get in the database. You have a one to one correspondence between a .NET type and a database table. It's very easy to reason about this uh, in people's heads. Whereas when you look at TPH or we'll see in TPC, there is a transformation going on. Right? You have in TPH, you have a lot of types with a whole hierarchy, and somehow it's transformed into a single table, which is, you know, it's actual conceptual, extra conceptual burden for us developers when we're doing this. Um, so that's another reason why we're seeing people like TPT many times. Again, we, I think that the thing Arthur was trying to convey at the t in the team and in general, based on performance, um, um, you know, um, investigations, TPT is rarely a good choice. It's usually supposed to be your last choice, but we'll we'll get back to this. Yep. <clears throat> okay. So, TPC is uh, this is what we're introducing in uh, EF Core um, seven, uh, it's in preview five, and TPC is similar to TPT in that there are multiple tables, but in this case, there are only tables for concrete types in the hierarchy. That's why it's called TPT table per concrete type. So you remember in our model, the animals class is abstract. Uh, so we don't have a table for animals. And if we, if we had also created pets abstract, which is a very reasonable modeling thing to do, we also would not have uh, a table for pets. Right. So what we do have is tables for anything that's a concrete type and each of these tables can have what you might consider duplicated columns. So, for example, you'll notice that each of these tables has a species column because anything that is an animal has a species. Um, and but they don't have not these tables don't have columns for things that aren't in that concrete type. So, for example, there's no educational level in dogs and there's no favorite toy in cats. Right. So this looks a bit weird, but if you think about the if you think about this, the advantage here is that you are grouping all of the information that you need for a particular instance of an object in a single table. So if I want a cat, 
I don't have to join with some other table in order to get the species, for example. It's all included in this table. And if we look at some data here, you can kind of see that. So you can see here that you know we're, we're, we've saved uh, four concrete types into this. There's actually no pet concrete type in my test data, so there's nothing in that table. Um, good indication that it should be an abstract class in my model if this is the kind of data I have. Um, uh, but you'll see that in the cats, in the cats table, it's got all the information. If I want to query for cats, for example, it's all there, and I only need to query one table. And furthermore, unlike TPH, it doesn't have all of those additional columns for properties that cats don't have, and it doesn't have any additional rows for things that aren't cats. So it's a very compact storage of the data for a particular concrete type. So this gives it some of the, uh, you know, some of the advantages of TPT um, in terms of the not having the wideness and not having the nulls and all of that kind of stuff in there without some of the disadvantages of TPT in that you always have to join a bunch of stuff together. On the other hand, you know, there are, this isn't perfect if you want every kind of animal you don't just want, for example, cats. You still need to query all four tables because you have to bring all of that together. Although, as we'll look at, it's not quite the same as a join, and so it also kind of performs a bit better. OK, so that's the overview of these things. And now we're going we're gonna to go look at some code, unless there's questions we should stop on. No? Nope. OK, so what I have here is this is essentially the same uh, inheritance hierarchy that I've shown in the that we've shown in the blog post, um, but enhanced a little bit to show a few more things that we didn't cover there. Uh, in particular, um, we've got some relationships to other types in there so we can see what happens with foreign keys. Um, so we've got two we've got relationship two ways. So I've added a, a DNA sequence. So every animal also well. It's optional, but they have uh, optionally can be associated with their DNA sequences. So that's a relationship where the foreign key is on the um, the type with the hierarchy. And then I have a human uh, entity type here with a favorite animal. And this is a relationship going in the other direction where the foreign key references the type in the hierarchy. OK, so those are the, the two kinds of relationships I've added to this. Um, and I've also made a pair abstract um, in this case because I'm uh, I'm actually using a, a hack together build that I created about uh, an hour ago here because I ran into another bug. But we'll get that fixed in in the daily builds very soon. Um, and it's only if you're using high low value generation, so it probably doesn't impact a lot of people. Okay, so this is our this is our model, um, and. We have here basically a very simple uh, DB context. Um, and I've got uh, DB sets for each of these types uh, in, a, in a very normal kind of pattern. I'm using a SQL Server. I'm logging only command executed events so we can see the SQL that gets generated. And at the moment, I've got no configuration in on model creating. Um, if you have a hierarchy like this, and you have no configuration in our model creating, then um, EF Core is going to create a TPH um, uh, model by default. That's the default mapping it'll create. One thing to point out is if, if you come from EF6, in EF6, if you included animal in the model, we would sometimes try and find in the same assembly um, types that derive from animal and automatically include those in the model. We try and avoid assembly scanning in EF Core. It's it's problematic in a number of reasons for an, in a number of cases, and so we don't do that in EF Core. So in EF Core, if you want to include pet in the model, cat in the model, it's not going to be found automatically, and you have to either have a DB set for it or have a, an entity type uh, call in the model builder. Um, so that's just something to be aware of if you're coming from from EF6. Um, so um, I have some code here also. Um, which does very simple things, create some DNA sequences. The, apparently, the DNA sequences for these animals are very simple. It's just three amino acids, uh, so one protein with three three amino acids in it. And strangely, cat is CAT, CAT, CAT. I don't know. Didn't mm -hmm. know that, but that's the DNA sequence. I see what you cat, did apparently. there. <laughs> nice. Anyway, 
Um, and so then we're just doing an add range to add this. This is basically the same data that we just saw. Uh, we're going to save it, and then we're going to run a few queries on it to see what the queries are. So we've got TPH here. Um, so let me run this uh, with um, TPH. And this is where it crashes because it's a, a build that I just did an hour ago, or not. Okay, so a few things to point out here. Now, most of this is going to be what we saw already in the blog post. Um, we've created a single table. Um, in this case, it's got a few more things in it because um, I created a relationship to DNA sequence. So we've got a, a foreign key constraint here. We've got the foreign key column DNA ID in there, but otherwise this is, uh, this is the same thing. Um, we also have a table for humans because I created that additional table and it has a foreign key and a foreign key constraint back to animals. Now that perfectly normal. <clears throat> um, I only point that out so that when we get to TPC, we'll see something different there. Um, but there's nothing unusual uh, about that. Um, and now we're going to insert in here and we're using um, we're using normal identity. We've created a normal identity column. We haven't done anything special uh, for inserts. We're going to look at high low strategies for inserting later, which makes it a bit different. Um, but for now, there's no issue with using identity columns in TPH. It's just the normal thing that you would normally do. There's just one table, so no problems, right? Uh, so the in inserts are very simple. Whenever we're inserting, in fact, I think there should be just a single, a single. In oh no, we're doing we're doing two inserts: one for DNA and one for animals. Um, and that's because of the fact that we need the DNA IDs before we put them into animals, right, Chai? And that's the mm -hmm. that's something we're going to look at. That is um, why Hilo is that's exists. an advantage exactly. of Hilo. Exactly, but. The main thing to say here is to store any animal. It's just it's just one command that stores stores all of the animals, and we've just got parameters for all of the different uh, animals that go all of the different rows that go in there. So we don't have to be inserting it into lots of different tables. Um, okay, and now let's look at these queries. So let, before we do that, let's let's look at the code quick, quickly again for the queries, just to see what the queries actually are. And these are super simple queries. Um, actually, we, we probably don't even need to include, do the include here at this point. Um, just doing that for completeness, but let's make the SQL simpler and not even include that right now. And let's run that again. So basically what we're doing is there's, there's three different types of queries to illustrate the different advantages and disadvantages of the inheritance strategies. So there's one where <clears throat> Query in every type of animal. So I don't care if it's a cat or it's a dog or it's a sheep or anything, right? We want all animals out of it. Um, and we're putting a filter on here so it's not, you know, just, just to have something else in the query so we can see how it all works together. But it's just basically any animals that start with F, where the species start with F, which is quite a few of them, actually, I think. Oh, no, it's only the cats. That's the way it should be, right? Um, <laughs> and then this 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 second query is for something that's not a leaf type and not the base type. So pets is in the middle of the hierarchy. So in this case, we're querying for a certain subset of that tree, a certain like branch of the tree, basically. Um, uh, but not just not just a leaf type and not everything. And then the last query is, as you would expect, we're querying just for a leaf type. So we only want cats back from here. Okay, so those are the those are the queries. Did I run this again? I'll run it again just in case I didn't. Um, so let's look at the the SQL that gets uh, generated here. Um, so it's all very simple, right? It's basically selecting from a single table um, and pulling back all of the columns. And um, if you're if you're asking for everything, which is where TPH is really good, there's not there's no filters on discriminate or anything. It's just basically this where clause that we put in, um, but otherwise it's just select from the animals table. Um, <coughs> the second query where we're going for uh, some sub part of the tree, it's the same as above, except in this case we're saying in the query discriminate and only give me cats and dogs. In this case, we remember we've made pet abstract here, so we don't actually have to. There's no, there's never a discriminator value pet because there's never any instance of pets. So even though we've said pets, we're only filtering by the leaf types that that can possibly be, which is cat and dog. 
Uh, and then in the last case, again, simple, but in this case, we're just, all we want is cats. So we're filtering out everything that isn't a cat. Um, do we want to talk about perf now, Shai, or should we go on and look at the other queries and then bring it together and talk about the perf? Um, up to you. We can, we can, we can do it later if you want. Okay. Like more, let's let's go look at the other the queries first and then we'll come okay. back and look at the perf. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's TPH. Um, let me go back to my uh, model configuration here. Now, um, I will also, before we, before we move off TPH, I want to show you that we now have um, a new API. Um, so if I do entity animal, we can do use, you see we have these three things here. Use TPC mapping strategy, use TPH mapping strategy, use TPT mapping strategy. You have no idea how long we <laughs> discuss these names. Anyway. <laughs> should the P and the H be uh, uppercase here? Uh, like no, TPH it should not. Uppercase. Don't even go there. Should in fact, I was going to point out, I was going to point out that in my model. Thank you for reminding me, Sean. Um, B and A here, lowercase n, lowercase a. If you're doing uppercase n and uppercase a, you're doing it wrong. No, <laughs> this is the this Arthur is has the some very naming, strong feelings about convention. certain yes. naming questions. Now we yes. could get even more controversial if we started talking about two letter acronyms, because um, my understanding is that when they had the um, the IO writer class, for example, uh, IO stream, um, they didn't. They thought if it was called IO stream people would confuse that with the moon, IO. And so that would be horrible. And so for two letters, it has to be IO. But that's inconsistent. So on the EFT, we've always said, that's that's rubbish. We're not doing that. If it's two letters, it's still following that convention. But that could get very controversial. Anyway, yes, so back to, back to what we're actually talking about. Use TPH mapping strategy. Doesn't do anything in this case. But if you want to be explicit, that's what you're doing in your model, then you can call UT, use TPH mapping strategy. So let's let's look at TPT. TPT existed since 506060, uh, 60 five. I think. 5 was I think it 5? Five? 5. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was 5. Okay. I thought it was 6, but never mind. I might be wrong. Um, anyway, it's it's already there in the in the ones that we, that are fully released and everything. So um although you know 5 is out of support, right? So don't don't be using 5. Um anyway, um Sorry. So the way you would historically configure uh, a TPT strategy is you would just simply say, oh, I actually want to map all these different tables. So this basically says to EF, these are all going to get mapped to different tables. Therefore, do a TPT strategy. Um, you can actually, of course, uh, nowadays, like I was just showing, you can do the model builder. Well, actually, we've got the entity animal there. So we could just do um, use uh, TPT strategy on there, and then you don't actually need all of this stuff here, right? It, it basically says, um, I'm going to use a default naming convention for um, for tables, but use it in a TPT strategy. There's a bug right now, though, that um, these DB set names are not actually used for the table names like they should be. Um, and so that's why I have this additional code in just to put the table names be what we'd expect them to be. But Andre is going to fix this soon and it will be in daily build soon, I'm very sure. Um, okay, so this is how we map to TPT. Um, so let's uh, let's run the same code again and then let's look at the, the tables and the queries that, and the inserts and updates and the queries. Okay, so as we should expect, we've got tables for um, every, uh, for each of the, well, we've got the DNA sequence table and then we've got tables for every um, type in the hierarchy, including the abstract types, animals and pets have their own tables. Um, and so this is what we'd expect here. Um, if we go and look at the human, where's the humans table? I'm not seeing it. Uh, pets, humans, there it is. See, humans table, it again has this foreign key constraint going to the, and, and this is a foreign key constraint going to the root type, the animals table. So because we've got a table that is used by every 
type of animal. There's always a row, remember, in animals. There's always a row in animals. We can create a normal foreign key constraint to it, and that's perfectly normal. Again, nothing unusual there. I'm pointing that out so that when we get to TPC, you can see that it's a little different. OK, so now when we want to insert stuff, we now have to <laughs> write a bunch of different inserts to get stuff into all of the different tables, right? So there's, there's, there's several inserts into different tables here. Um, is that right, Shai? Am I getting that right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, we're in GPT. Yeah. So every yeah. every table needs to have its own insert. Or when you, by the way, when you guys see a merge in there, uh, if you scroll up, you can see a merge. Um, yeah, for example, this. So don't don't be afraid. That's a SQL Server specific optimization. It's just a thing we do, a technique we use to insert many, like multiple rows in one command in one go for performance. But it's just basically a bunch of inserts conceptually. That's all it is. Yeah. Um, you know what I'm going to do uh, here? I'm going to put a... console right line in there so we can actually see where the query starts, just so it makes it easier to read a bit. Mm. OK, so right. So here we are. Here's the queries. Um, so this is a query for every type of animal. The, the main query is against the, the base table, but then so against animals. Um, so from animals here, but then we have to left join every other table, right? Um, and this is slow. This is this these kind of queries are slow to execute because join, joining multiple tables together is a slow thing. So this is where TPT is really bad um, when you do queries that are trying to bring everything back in the hierarchy. Um, if we're going to the middle of the hierarchy, it's not quite as bad because um, we uh, we only have to join um, four tables here because we know that if we're getting pets, then farm animals doesn't inherit from pets. So we still need the base type because there's stuff in the base in the base table that is for any type, but we don't need one of the one of the leaf types because it's not in that part of the tree that we're querying for. And then if we're go if we're getting um, only one type, so we only want cats, so we still have to do three tables. We still have to get animals to get the stuff that's common to all animals. We still have to get pets for the stuff that's common to pets, and we still have to get cats for the stuff that's specific to cats. So even in that type, even in that case, we're doing a join. Uh, we're joining. We're doing two joins on the on two and querying from three tables. Um, do you want to? Should we talk about the difference in perf between TPH and TPT now? That might be a, sure. a good place, um, to, and then we can come back and look at TPC and how it changes right. things. Absolutely. So, um, as you were saying many times already, so we have we have this thing with TPT where we have to query multiple tables, and it's not just about querying multiple tables. We also have to join multiple tables. Now, anybody using um, relational databases should, in general, know that joins are a major source of slowdown. Right? That's one of the tasks that make a, that make a database work hard because a database now has to go over two tables and match two rows based on their IDs. That's not a trivial task to do, even if you have proper indexes. Um, um, so in general, always think about your joins. And that's why we have this idea of denormalizing data. Uh, if you have a principal and a dependent, sometimes we're going to copy data across from the dependent into the principal when it makes sense so that we don't have to join with it. So just for performance sake, we're going to denormalize our database schema just to avoid a join. Now, what TPT does, unfortunately, is the exact opposite of that. Because it's such a hyper-normalized kind of approach, it's going to introduce a lot more joins than, for definitely, in compared to TPH, for example, right? And that is a sort of a source of major slowdown. I'm going to show um, I'm going to show um, um, my screenshot. If somebody can put my screenshot on. Um, I can probably do it. Yeah, exactly. So uh, this is just, I just want to make make sure that people are aware of this section in our docs. We have our performance um, uh, section in, in the EF Core docs. This is just the EF Core docs. And in it is something called modeling for performance. That's this section that you can see highlighted on your left. It just gives you tips on how to you know model, how to uh, model your database or your EF Core model uh, in, an, in an efficient way. And one of the things there is this can point about- Can we bigger? Um, we can. Usually, I'm the guy complaining. I was going to say that, yeah. <laughs> is this big enough? It is for me. I'm just, you know. Okay. 
Uh, I've, hopefully. Got my, I've got my 32 inch monitor. I'm fine, <laughs> but I'm just doing it for other people. So <laughs> hopefully, uh, hopefully people are okay with this. Uh, so you can see TPH and TPT covered here. We haven't yet uh, obviously covered TPC because we just, you know, we just uh, released the actual feature in a preview, uh, but we're going to get there by the time we release. Now I wrote, uh, I hacked together um, a benchmark uh, to compare TPH with TPT. So what you can see here, this is a very arbitrary benchmark. So there's never a single uh, answer to these questions of performance. It's always a question of how many tables do you have in your hierarchy? How many columns do each does each table have? What's the date, the actual data composition of things? So it's, it's always a very complicated um, question to answer. But in this specific thing, what I did is I, I set up a seven type hierarchy. Uh, there are 5,000 rows seated for each single type. So we have 35,000 rows in total. And the benchmark simply gets all of them. So the absolute worst scenario for TPT, right? I chose the, the absolute worst scenario because it has to join all the seven tables. And what we see here, there's a benchmark that and benchmark. You can see that there's a difference between 132 milliseconds and 201 milliseconds, which is a pretty huge difference when you're, you know, when you're doing a query. Uh, you may look at this and say, okay, but you know, when am I going to load 35,000, um, you know, rows and, and include everything in TPT? Up to you, you're the one who knows. And the only thing as always with performance is to set things up your way and then do a proper benchmark your way with benchmark.net, not some stopwatch, you know, house thrown kind of benchmarking technique. If you do a proper benchmarking, uh, a benchmark for your situation and the, the perf difference is fine, by all means use TPT. But our general guidance here would be Proof that TPT is is okay is not slow for you, rather than defaulting to it. If you're if you've made sure TPT is fine for you, use it. TPT is supported by EF Core. It's a feature, but it should not be your default thing. And I highly recommend benchmarking before you actually commit to it in in production and so on. I think there's a I think that there's a very important point there though, which is it's very easy to get hung up on these kinds of things, um, not just in inheritance hierarchies, but in, in lots of things in coding and in lots of things in database design, where you where you you like super concerned is the perf going to be okay on this, and in lots of cases, from for lots of applications, it doesn't matter. It's not it's not a bottleneck in your particular application. TPT firm performs fine, and TPH performs fine. Maybe TPH is faster than TPP academically but your users don't see any different. You're not using significantly more resources. It's like, so um, yeah, benchmark, yeah. but don't get hung up on it. You know, don't get, it's like, we have to go and do this thing because Perth might be, uh, you know, might be bad, you know? Um, I, I will say a, one thing. Yeah, go ahead. There's a there's a term, uh, Yagni, you know, you ain't going to need it, um, which I think doesn't get, you know, a lot of people think of dry, don't repeat yourself and then make sure dry, make sure dry, you know, and do this architecture, do a DDD thing and do, make everything clean and everything. Lots of applications should think more about Yagni. Like, don't do this complicated thing. You ain't going to need it. It's not important for your application. So um, always keep that in mind, Shai. So one, one comment on this, uh, I, I very much agree with this in many cases. Um, the TPT versus TPH question though, I think one interesting thing about it is that it doesn't really cost you anything. It's more of a decision that you make and as, assuming you're just using EF Core in a normal application, you don't you don't have to really care about what happens under under the hood, like how many which tables are created and how it, EF Core takes care of that. Of course, that's not true of, of any application and all applications, but if you're that kind of application, the, the, the decision to use TPH or TPT, you can choose either one. It's not gonna make any difference. It's not like you're, comp you're making your code more complex or adding maintenance burden by going with the high performance option. Uh, so there's this saying that's very often misused, uh, premature optimization is the root of all evil. Uh, and yes, you shouldn't, uh, you know, write very convoluted code and make and take take on risks because you want to uh, optimize something which you haven't even shown is important. Uh, I fully agree with this. But on the other hand, uh, you shouldn't use that saying premature optimization is the root of all evil to not think about perf at all. Just <laughs> just not think about it because it doesn't matter. And just, you know, do something like choose TPT over TPH 
for for no reason at all or just because you think normalization is kind of cool um so it, i don't think there's any cost associated with uh with with choosing tph over tpd which is why i'd recommend defaulting to it but if for example you do have some reason where why tph is more complex in your specific scenario or whatever yeah by all means use tpt if, if that's the thing like arthur said and i do wanna i do wanna highlight somebody wrote this comment here as i was talking I like TPT for write dbs, um, so I, I'm not um, I'm not completely sure what, what the reference here is, but I'm going to use this to say that TPT is also um, I would say quite bad for inserts or for writes as well, ex for exactly the same reason. In, um, instead of um, uh, so one one thing is that you have to insert into five different tables where a, nor a normal TPH thing inserts a single row into a single table that in itself is a is a pretty dramatic change. I didn't benchmark this by the way. What you're seeing on your screen is a benchmark only for queries, but I'm sure that uh, you know inserting would show something very similar. There's another subtle point here. I love to talk about round trips. Uh, but remember that in TPT, you have an ID that's uh, typically auto-generated. Let's say there's an identity ID, like Arthur was just saying, at the root table. And then you have foreign key constraints from all the ch children table, uh, right? So what that means is that if I insert a single uh, cat or whatever into the database, what I'm going to do is I'm going to send a single insert into the root. And then I'm going to have to wait to get back that ID that got generated, and only then I can insert all the rest of the children of the children table uh, entries rows because they have to contain that thing, that foreign key. Um, so what I'm trying to say is that every insert into a TPT hierarchy, which has a database generated primary key, is going to involve two round trips to your database, and round trips are a particularly nasty source of perf problems. So it's not just about doing five inserts, which we could batch in a single uh, round trip. That would be maybe fine, but it's also doing two round trips. So if you are doing TPT, keep it in mind that there's ways to mitigate mitigate this with high low and GUIDs, and we'll talk about that later. So we can actually see that in the in the query, the SQL that we generated here. So this is the insert into the animals table, and it's doing output inserted ID, right? So this is how it's getting back the the primary key that was generated when we inserted into the animals table. And then when we do the insert here into, what's the next one we're doing into farm animals, this ID value is actually being passed. The value that we pass in here, which is one of these parameters, I don't know which one, is the value that we got back. So EF core is like saying, okay, I got this back and now I know because there's a relationship between these tables, there's a foreign key there, that this foreign key now needs to be used for the primary key of the next insert and so I'll do that. But EF core is doing that for you, which is why there's a round trip for that. Okay, shall we go look at TPC? Let's do that. So let me go back to my model. Okay, so how do we do uh, TPC mapping? Well, um, as we've seen before, we have this use TPC mapping strategy. And technically, in order to get TPC, um, all I need to do is, is that, and that will create TPC. I don't need to do anything else to all the other entity types. Um, so, but I'm doing some other stuff here as well um, to make this work uh, in uh, an effective manner. Um, first, I am actually adding a two table call. Um, I don't know why I have that there. That's, uh, that's not needed. Um, I'm doing a two table call for my concrete tables. I'm not doing it for the for the pets and the animal based table because they, there are no tables for those types in a, in a TPC mapping. Um, but because of the bug that I said where these DB set names are not being used for the table names, I've got this additional calls in here to just uh, work around that for right now. Um, so normally you wouldn't see this. So the other thing, um, the other problem with TPC um, is that, um, so let me, Let's uh, let's go look at the the blog post again here because I think it'll be easier to see here. So um, let's look at these tables that we've created for the TPC mapping. And now each of these tables has an ID primary key value. But when you insert a uh, cat. 
for a T into a into uh, a database with TPC, you only insert a row uh, into the catch table. You don't insert a row into any other table. So unlike TPT, where you've got this base table and any animal that you insert will have a row in there, in TPC you don't have this common place that can manage and handle uh, primary key values. So for example, you can't just use a simple uh, identity um, and a simple identity column on that um, because you're going to get clashes between the IDs of the different tables. If you put identity on each of these, then when you inserted a pet, it would get ID one. But then when you insert a cat, because it's got its own identity, it would also get ID one. And then when you query, you have two entities with the same uh, key value. Now, Diego always used to say, well, we should include the type as part of the primary key value by default, and that would solve that problem or anything, which there's pros and cons of doing that. You know, um, it, it adds a bunch of complexity to the modeling and the concept of the primary key. So basically, um, you have to have a unique value for every object in the hierarchy, which means you can't do a simple identity column um, like you could with um, TPH or TPT. Um, so going back to the code here, um, the way we're going to deal with that is we're going to use a database sequence. So if your database supports sequences, which most databases do, SQLite, uh, I believe, doesn't, although Bryce in chat can correct me if that's 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 wrong. Um, <clears throat> what we're going to do is use a database sequence. So this creates an object in the database which its sole purpose is to generate uh, values. So it's going to generate one, two, three, four. I mean, you can change it to start at different values and different increments, but basically going to generate one, two, three, four, and it does it in an atomic way. So wherever I, whenever I ask for a value, I know I'm going to get a unique value from it, and then it will automatically increment. So because this is its own object, it can be referenced by multiple tables, unlike the identity column. Um, and so then we have this. Um, this little bit of we have a basically a column default constraint on the column that just says get the next value from that sequence and put it in that, right so whichever whichever table we're inserting whether we're inserting a cat into the cat table or a dog into the dog table or a farm animal into a farm animal table whichever one we're doing we're going to get an id from that sequence and so the first one we insert the cat for example will get a one the second one if it's a dog will get a two so there'll be no clashes and in fact we can see that if we go look at the the data here see um in this case we <coughs> we inserted alice first she got one mac got two toast got three and the sheep got four so um the, that it, it, this is a simple way if you've got sequences um, of getting a generated uh, ID value for that. Um, this isn't currently set up by convention um, in EF Core. Um, by convention, when you do a TPC, you don't get a generated key value. And in fact, you'll, you'll get, a, hopefully, I think, a nice exception. Uh, we should try that. I'm going off script now, so let's see what happens. I think you get something that's, I think, a relatively clear message if you do this. But maybe you don't. Uh, no, you don't. You just get kind of insert null into ID. I think it's, I think it's if you, if you, if what you do here is you say, um, if you just make this. value generated on add, but don't give it a way to do it. That's when we get the nicer message. I'm, I'm not sure this is the best experience, so we might actually change what the default here is. Um, so in this case, you get, uh, I don't know, you still get the same thing. I don't know that. There's pro probably something where we could, this is teach me for going off scripts, probably somewhere where we can do a better job there, right? But um, basically, you could, it's pretty easy to use a sequence. You just say have sequence and then EF core will create that in your migrations, create the sequence for you, and then you can say has default value SQL. Um, this is probably a database specific uh, SQL. Um, depending, getting the value from a sequence is different in different databases. So this is for SQL Server, but it's going to be different for Postgres, I assume, and MySQL. And Shai is nodding there. Do you know what it is for Postgres, Shai? You're muted, by the way. 
Yeah, I, I do know what it is for Postgres. It's very equivalent. It's there's a, there's another function for that. Uh, I do want to say though that we I think we agreed to actually make that the default for 7.0. So we're gonna uh, for SQL Server specifically. Yes. We have a go we the intention is to uh, automatically set up the sequence for you and the default value like we do for for normal tables with identity. If you yes. choose DPC, then we will do that for you by default. But it's a little bit tricky because, for example, SQLite doesn't have sequences, so we're not going to be able to do it there. So it's 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 a bit tricky. But at least for SQL Server and uh, hopefully other uh, relational databases, we hope to be able to deliver the the this this yes. good experience out of the box. Yes. Okay. So um, we're going to come back to this uh, when we look at high low in a minute. But for now, I'm going to um, run this code now that it should actually work because it will use the sequence. Um, and uh, we're going to go look at the table creation. Remember, we've got those relationships that we didn't have in the blog post, um, which is the primary thing I want to look at. Um, so yeah, so we've got a cat's table, a dog's table, and a farm animal's table. No pets table in this case because pets is abstract. Um, and then we've got um, the humans table again. Now, this favorite animal ID is a foreign key to animals, but there's no foreign key constraint in it. Why is there no foreign, foreign key constraint? Well, because a foreign key constraint basically goes to one other table. So, um, so when we did TPT, um, maybe I should uh, maybe should run the let me run the TPT uh, version again so we can look at that. Um, but when I did TPT, that constraint went to the base table. Obviously, in TPH, there is only one table, so it just goes to that table. But when we do it in with TPT, <clears throat> going to go to the animals table. Um, because animals, as we've mentioned many, many times now, has a row for whatever animal is saved. And so um, let's see, where's humans here? Great table humans. So you can see we've got this constraint right here. And this says do a constraint uh, references the animal table ID column, right? So we've got foreign animal ID and it's constrained to animals ID. Now, why can't we do that in TP TPC? Well, because there is no single table. It would have to be, the constraint would basically have to say, make sure there's, it's either the ID in cat, or it's the ID in dog, or it's the ID in farm animal, or it's the ID, uh, no, I think those are the three tables we have in our current model, right? Um, and if you want to be pedantic about it, but not in any, not in multiple of those, it has to be only one and only one of those three and has to be in some of them. And that's a fairly complex, I don't know if you can even write that constraint with a, with a custom constraint in, in a well, relational database. Well, constraints, check constraints don't support cross table yeah, so. um, in general. You could write a trigger with a convoluted oh, SQL. Uh, which 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 does this, but you know that's way beyond yes. the scope of what anybody. Okay, wants. so so this is um, so the fact that this 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 constraint is missing is possibly a a disadvantage. I mean, it is a disadvantage of TPC. You lose that check on your data integrity. Now, but this again, but then again, you're using an RRM like EF Core to do these things, and you if you use a EF Core to insert and query for, and all of that stuff of your data in the in the database, then internally EF Core is going to make sure that this value is set to the right thing and it's not uh, abused, it's not set you know to something that it can't that can't be correct. And so when you're using an ORM mapper, the fact that the constraint itself doesn't exist in the database is I would say a lot less significant than if you're writing your own raw uh, insert uh, commands against this where it's very easy to get it wrong because there's no constraint. Um, but that being said, you don't you lose that checking in the database, which is um, which is potentially not a good thing. On the other hand, I, I know there are some places that say, I don't agree with this, but say don't create any foreign key constraints in the database because the checking slows stuff down. Now I don't agree with that, but some people do that anyway. So um, now um, we also had a relationship going in the opposite direction. Um, from uh, animals to the DNA sequence. And you can see that doesn't suffer from this problem. So it's only when you're referencing the type in the hierarchy that it's a problem. Because in, in the other case, you just can create the, the same foreign key constraint basically on um, 
all of the three tables. So in this case, it's it works perfectly fine. Um, so that's uh, so I wanted to call somebody somebody put a comment on the blog post that we hadn't covered that in the blog post, which I thought was a very good comment. So um, I'm sure somebody shy probably will answer it on the on the blog post. Um, but uh, I wanted to cover that in uh, in the stream today so that people are aware of it. OK, um, do we want to look at TPC per first or do we do we look at uh, high low and then come back to perf? Let's look at TPC perf because high low okay. is like an, an additional thing that isn't. Yes. Uh, That's right. So shall I add uh, you back? Yes, please. Exactly. Okay. Um, oh, so sparse columns. We missed that when we talked about yeah, TPH. <laughs> I, I will. I will talk about it right now. So I sat down and did some uh, some perf investigations um, two days ago. Uh, this is really raw, and I can't. Ex oh, thank you. I'm I'm now at the receiving end of this. Uh, <laughs> Um, anybody who's interested can go and, and check out this issue. Uh, but uh, so this is a little bit of perf uh, investigation uh, comparing TPH and TPC. I can't really explain everything I see here. There's some pretty weird results, but there are some interesting things already. So what I did here just to set set across, uh, just to set the, uh, the thing. So what we have here um, is TPH versus TPC. There are five different types uh, in the hierarchy. It's just a flat hierarchy. It's not like a deep hierarchy. We have a total of 1 million rows. Rows, and it's uh, split uh, five ways, so 200k rows for each type. Very, very simple. Uh, in the uh, uh, in the TPH scenario, um, let, let's let's take a look. So, okay, so first of all, we're going to take a look at actual table size on disk, which is something we haven't actually discussed. So, the the whole TPH thing, by the way, uh, has all those nulls. We're going back to the first part of it because TPH has all those nulls because of the wide columns that could mean that we uh, increase the disk space requirements, right? So we're not talking about query performance now, we're talking about how much your actual database takes on disk and how that's gonna scale. Um, so I, I investigated that a little bit. And what you can see here, you have a TPH uh, wide scenario, which basically means that we have a single TPH table. There's 50 columns there, uh, column one to 50, and only five, five of them are only actually uh, ever populated. So 45 columns contain null throughout 1 million rows, just to simulate a very wide table that has a lot of very sparsely populated columns. Um, and what we see here, I think this is the one that we, we care about the most, is how much data this takes on this. That takes 121 megabytes, more or less, plus another 57 megabytes of index data, by the way. Uh, the interesting uh, thing about this, so th this is meant to introduce uh, to you a, a, a feature of SQL Server. SQL Server has a thing called C sparse columns, uh, where if you have a column that's suspected to be mostly nulls, you can, when you define that column, you can say that is a sparse column. And then SQL Server is going to do various optimizations behind the scene to make sure that that column works, uh, you know, takes up less space because it knows that it's going to be a lot of nulls in there. The flip side of it is it's going to be a little bit slower for updates and, and queries when it's non-null. So there's there's you know there's like um there's there's a pros and cons. There's some balancing there to do, and you have to read the documentation for SQL Server and make up your own mind. So we never make columns in SQL Server sparse by default because it's not a it's not a straightforward decision. However, what we do have is uh, um, I introduced this back in 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 EF Core five, which is when we introduced TPT, so that you could use TPH in a more efficient way. So if you turn this on. You have the exact same scenario, but with sparse columns. You can see that instead of 179 megabytes, we now have 121. So that's a pretty dramatic safe savings in space, uh, which is done, which is achieved through the SQL Server feature called sparse columns. Um, that, that uh, sorry, we, we should be looking at this column instead of instead of that. Sorry, uh, my bad. The reserve thing is the less important thing. You have 121 megabytes versus 63. So it's almost a twofold difference just by virtue of enabling sparse columns. I'll just switch to the docs for this. If you look in our docs at the SQL Server um, documentation, you go to columns, you can see sparse column support. It's as easy as saying is sparse on a property. It's really, really, really very easy. This property was, this, this feature was basically made for TPH, I want to say. It's almost like uh, it goes hand in hand with TPH. I really, really recommend if you have a lot of, you know, a lot of these very, very null populated columns, take a look at this and evaluate if you want to make make your columns sparse. But now we're going to get back to the this investigation. 
Um, does, um, um, sorry. does Postgres have sparse columns? MySQL have sparse columns? So let's let's check out what the Postgres savings look like here. Um, or, or rather, uh, I'll, you know what? I'll answer that in a, in a second. Okay. We're going to go continue with SQL Server. You're going to see that yourself. What I did in addition to this uh, TPH wide, I also did TPH narrow, which is the same thing, except that it has only those five columns. And it doesn't have the additional 45 null populated columns. And this was exactly to see, you know, how things fare. Uh, how much are we paying for those extra columns, which are mainly nulls, basically? And what you see is, is quite interesting. Uh, TPH narrow is, 600, is uh, 60 megabytes. Okay, that's compared to, uh, to the sparse scenario with wide columns, 63. So it's very, very close. A very wide column, but with sparse columns, is almost the same as a table without all of those extra columns. So sparse columns really work well. They bring us all down to, it, they make those null columns effectively free, which is quite, quite good. Of course, this doesn't take into account the cost of sparse columns when you're querying and updating. So again, read the SQL Server docs really carefully before you do this. There's, it's, it can be a little bit tricky. Um, I even define sparse on narrow, and that doesn't that even makes it a little bit bigger. So um, it's it's a bit weird. I can't really explain why this is, but but it is like that. But then uh, we also have the TPC example, which is five tables instead of one table with five columns. And here, what you see is you still see a pretty big uh, savings. So even with sparse columns, SQL Server still doesn't is still you know we still have twice the you know the disk space that we have here which is quite interesting. We also don't, uh, so this scenario also defines an index on the discriminator, which we don't need in TPC, which is why you're seeing this difference in, in indexes as well. So there's there's another thing going on there. You don't necessarily have to define an index on your discriminator. It doesn't always help. So take it, take it, uh, take it or leave it. Um, I found this, sorry, go ahead, Arthur. I was just gonna say that, but we're talking about the disk safe space, the disk space savings, but does it really matter? in today's right. world that we save that disk space? I mean, is that that important? You're right. I, I tend to agree with you. And I, I mean, what you're seeing here is a million rows and we're talking about uh, tens of megabytes, right? So people keep this in mind. It's like what, what Arthur was saying before, right? Uh, we can obsess over this all we want. And that's what I did uh, on Monday because I like to obsess over perf. But when you kind of zoom out and you're thinking about an extra 100 megabytes in today's world where you know, you know, we're talking about gigabytes. I'm not sure that's going to matter so much, but it is. It is important to keep this in 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 mind, right? And and if you are having like a huge wide TPH kind of table, sure, look into uh, sparse columns. It might be a good idea for you. I did want to compare very quickly to Postgres. Postgres doesn't have a a sparse column feature. Uh, however, the difference between wide and narrow is very very small. So between 54 megabytes and 46 megabytes. Again, the difference here is that we have an additional 45 columns across 1 million rows containing NAS only. That's the only difference. And the difference here is less than 10 megabytes. So I would conclude this in saying that in Postgres, columns are naturally sparse by default. You could say it like this, uh, except you don't pay anything, uh, at least not in the way that you do in SQL Server. Postgres is always awesome. That's all I'm going to say. Um, and the, the additional thing that I find quite impressive is that in Postgres, there's also no difference between one table with five columns and uh, five tables with one column. It's almost the same thing. Whereas weirdly in SQL Server, we have, uh, sorry, we have a twofold difference. So databases are very different between them, you know, across themselves and don't, don't make any assumptions. Um, do we have time to, to to talk about the query performance a little yeah, bit? Yeah, but I realized I didn't show the query, so let me... Oh, so let me definitely show... go, go show the query first. Absolutely. Yes. Um, this is Alice, by the way, one of our one of our um, sample data points today. She's going down now, so I can do this again. Okay, so let's look at the, let's look at the queries here. Um, so remember, the first query is when we're asking for all the types in the hierarchy, so anything that's an animal. Um, and um, in this case, pets and the animal are both abstract type, which means we only have three tables. So we're, we only have to query from, uh, you know, we have three concrete types, so we don't have to query from three tables. So this is already better than TPT in that scenario because there's fewer tables. Um, as Shai pointed out to me the other day, it's also better because we're doing this union all rather than a left join here. And uh, a union Very important. all is, um, doesn't require any kind of matching or filtering or anything like that. It's just basically 
dump these ones, then dump those ones, then dump the other ones, right? So, so this is already better than TPT here, um, but it's a lot more complex query than what you would have for TPH there, right? TPH is still only querying from one table. Uh, if we're querying for uh, a subpart of the tree, so in this case, just pets, uh, it's essentially the same as above, except of course, we don't actually have to include farm animals. So in this case, we're doing two tables uh, instead of the uh, four that would be in the TPT for this case. Um, and again, we're doing union all, but it's still two tables with a union all and not one like it would be for TPH. Where TPT really kind of, uh, TPC rather, really excels is when you're writing a query for a single type. Because in this case, all of the data, all of the cats data is stored in the cats table. Um, so it's a very, very simple query. And it also doesn't have any kind of discriminator in there, right? You don't have to filter anything out. You don't have any additional columns in there. Um, you're not bringing back any data that you don't need, basically. So this is, you know, basically the best SQL you could write um, across a TPT, TPC, and uh, TPH for um, any kind of thing. So if you're if you're doing a lot of queries where you're getting leafs out of the data, TPC is very good for that. So let's go look at the the benchmarking that that Shai has for that. Okay, so now we're back to the queries. Um... I admit I'm a little bit confused by the result I'm, I'm seeing on SQL Server, but I haven't had the time to actually dive deeply. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump to Postgres first because things make a bit more sense to me there. Uh, now, what I did is exactly what Arthur showed. Um, one scenario is select a single type, and the other one is select all the types because we want to compare those two uh, strategies together. So on Postgres, um, what you see here in the cost column is basically a projection. This is an explain um, uh, on Postgres, which tells you what the, the, the estimated total cost of a query is. It's between this and that. Uh, actually understanding exactly what that means is difficult, but we're not, we're not going to go into this. It's not that difficult, but anyway, you, you'll see the numbers and you'll understand. So for selecting a single type on um, TPH, you can see that we have, uh, um, um, you know, these costs here, uh, Sorry, so the wide and the narrow are not very, uh, you know, very interesting. And you can see that TPC, when you select a single type, is uh, more than twice as twice as fast, right? Or twice as like twice better, uh, whatever that means when when we're looking at the cost. This is because the SQL here, exactly as Arthur just said, is extremely simple. It cannot get simpler. You're just selecting everything. You're just selecting everything from a single table, as opposed to here, where we do have to do a where clause. That means that we have to use an index, and using an index is a little bit better compared to not just doing a table scan and so on. Now, it's important to understand um, this assumes that when we're getting all the, you know, the single entity, the cats or whatever, then we're just getting all the cats. But if we were to ask for all the cats where, you know, the cat has a certain education level, we're only interested in the smart cats, we might be using an index anyway to, to run that query quickly. And in that case, we're already using an index. So that wouldn't matter so much. Uh, that's a very tricky nuance point, what I'm kind of trying to say. Uh, so if you compare a complete table scan on the TP side to an index use on the TPH side, yes, TPC looks much better. But in real life, when you're not going to get all the cats out, maybe that's not going to be that much of a difference, right? I hope that that point kind of made it across, but it's, it's a little bit subtle. If we go down instead and we look at what happens when you select all types, things get reversed as we expect they do. That's, that's the whole point we're trying to make here, right? So if you look at TPH, then you're seeing we have this performance of 16... Uh, 1,862, whatever that means. And TPC is slower. It is slower because we're now doing union all between multiple types. Now, it's not that much slower. So I can tell you that the difference between this and this is not huge. And the reason is that union all is a very, very cheap operation to do in general. All it does, again, that's uh, Arthur said this before, you're basically, sh uh, you know, shoving, you, you, you can basically shove one table into, uh, you know, send it to the client, and then you shove the other table into the client. And that's, that's basically it. It's a very simple operation to do. You're not matching up rows between the different tables as you have to do in joins, which is what TPT does. And that's why it's, it's relatively catastrophic in terms of, of performance. So in Postgres, I see pretty much what I uh, what I think I would see. I will say that um, uh, uh, given these two tables, uh, you can see that there's a the bigger difference is here in general. Um, so TPC looks looks uh, better here. Here things don't look as big, but you have the index question up there. I would say 
you know, basically ask yourself, are you generally going to be uh, querying just for a single type or are you generally going to be getting a lot of types? If you're generally going to be getting a lot of types, maybe lean towards TPH. If you're getting a single type, maybe lean towards TPC. But I don't have a single answer for you, even given the Postgres uh, results. There are these scenarios, let's say in, in, in TPC, where you're using TPC or using inheritance just to uh, have the same fields on the different tables, right? And you're not actually going to be selecting all of those, you know, at both cats and dogs and whatever. You're just using the animal abstraction to propagate fields down to in your hierarchy. And in, the, in those kinds of cases, you're likely just going to be selecting cats or just going to be selecting dogs. If that is the case, and you're just using inheritance as a way of, you know, doing columns across the different things, I would say use TPC because it really models what you're going to be doing. If you're not so sure and you might be wanting to get all the house pets or all the whatever, TPH probably makes more sense. But I can't give, I, I wouldn't be able to give you like a straight answer here because unfortunately it's going to depend on so many things here. I'll just jump really quickly. I know we're, we're really over, but in, in I, no, I want to- We're always over, it's not. We're always over. I, I just want to look at those SQL Server uh, results. Maybe somebody in the audience will write me later and explain why, because I'm not I'm no SQL Server expert. I'm more of a Postgres guy. But what you see here is something interesting. So in TPH wide, which is again, not, not even sparse, we have a pretty high cost. And if we do a sparse, um, uh, if we use it on sparse columns, then I see a vastly reduced subtree cost. I don't really get why, because this thing only selects the ID and it looks at the discriminator. So all these other columns, whether they're sparse or not, it's a bit weird that this would affect, um, you know, the, the query. I'm guessing this is because all these these columns, which are null and not sparse, they take up, you know, blocks on disk space, and then we have to go through a lot more pages. There's something of or other going on. It just means that simply the table is much bigger on disk, so it takes us more time. I'm, I'm assuming that's the answer here. So making the, the columns sparse also helps your query uh, performance and not just your disk space, which is why if you are using TPH, even if you don't care about disk space, consider still using the SQL Server sparse column feature. Um, if you go narrow, you can see more or less the same kind of thing. So once again, like with the disk space thing, sparse gets us to the same place as we were with narrow in disk space and with um, um, you know query performance. But TPC is far far cheaper. Okay, that's 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 an important thing, and that's not very surprising, right? Um, because once again, we're just doing a, a simple you know select. There's no where. There's no no index. SQL Server wouldn't use an index anyway, even if it were here. It's not completely surprising. It's a bit dramatic. If it's a six-fold difference in, in speed, that would be quite dramatic. But query plan cost doesn't necessarily translate to a six-fold actual real-time thing. Again, this is a little bit complicated. Where it's a bit weird for me is select all types. So when, when you do select all types, uh, TPH wide is quite expensive. It's getting it down with sparse, we're already used to this by now. So we have the same values here but TPC is faster. Now this, for the life of me, I'm not sure how this is possible. So the thing <laughs> the thing where we do, um, uh, you know, select with many unions is somehow faster than the thing where we do, uh, you know, select with nothing. Again, I suspect, I do I do have a suspicion why this is. This These tables, even with the sparse and the narrow, again, still take up a lot, a lot more space in general than those five tables. So I think this is just a function of how much actual, uh, you know, blocks we're taking up on the disk and TPC still excels here, uh, even compared to TPH sparse narrow, because there are still nulls there. There are still these values, which you don't have in TPC. So it, in SQL Server, each null actually does make a difference in that sense, even for query and TPC is, is superior. In Postgres, things are very different, as you could see. So the situation was reversed. Yet another, um, yet another, so, you know, proof that databases are different. One thing that occurred to me, uh, partly from uh, seeing this question uh, about using a varcar discriminator, is I wonder if there's a difference here because we have the discriminator column in the TPH, and also I think in um, in the in the in the things that I showed, we're actually using a Varcon max, which is probably a very bad idea for the discriminator column. I remember we said it, we considered at some point 
changing the default discriminator column to not be a, a varkar max at least but um, yeah. it would have been a breaking change and like how big it That's should a great be question. And all that. so maybe that maybe there is something there about the discrim having either a discriminated column and or the fact that it's a string and or the fact that it's a varkar max that is causing a difference in uh That's in a SQL server uh, particularly because as I understand it, strings are handled quite differently in SQL Server. String columns are handled quite differently in SQL Server and in Postgres, where there is no multiple different types of string columns, right? Yeah, I, I'm not sure exactly how that maps to storage considerations and these the impact on perf, but you're right, and that's a that's a that's a very good thing that we should look at. Um, yeah, it's 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 an interesting thing, and and regardless, even for getting SQL Server and, and low level things, TPH does add a column that has yeah. data in it, uh, whereas TPC doesn't need it. So we've gotten yeah. rid of all that data, and if that's uh, if if your table doesn't contain very much then that's also a thing, right? That you need to calculate yeah. it. And though it is, it is supposed to be negligible in most cases, but yeah. And I said this earlier, but you know, I'll say it again, it's very easy in AF Core to uh, configure your discriminated column to be, for example, an integer um, and have different integer values. So um, we want to make the data like really easy to understand and see read by default, um, you know, clarity above everything else, but, um, Absolutely. but you and, can uh, configure that. That reminds me, by the way, um, you can control what the discriminator is. And if you want to, if you really wanted to, you could configure a discriminator to be an int and assign some int value to each one of your or an enum. I think we support this. So you, if I'm not mistaken, you can have mm -hmm. an enum as your discriminator you type. Can. Yep. which maps map to maps to an int right on sql server mm -hmm. so that would be a way of checking maybe if yep. we get rid of those strings maybe things look different i don't know it's a yep. good question yeah okay so we're significantly over do we want to look at high low generation really quickly or is that going to take know. too long i think uh, that, that may that might be a bit long but up to you uh, well, I'll just show it, you know, um, just to kind of whet people's appetites um, on it. Okay, so so what I have, you know, as, as we talked about here, what we're using is a sequence. And we have every time we want to insert, we have a default constraint that gets a value from that sequence. Um, and that's fine. And it's simple and it's easy, which is, you know, very important don't underestimate the it's simple and it's easy and it's understandable um however the high low pattern uses also uses a sequence but uses it in a slightly different way it creates a sequence and then it and then the client as in our dot net code requests a certain block of values basically from that sequence at some point and then it uses those values um, every time it wants to insert. So the difference there is that you're not doing the insert and then getting the value back that was generated for that primary key. You're instead retrieving a block of primary keys beforehand and then using them. Um, and uh, that further has consequences for the foreign key handling. Um, but before we get into that, I'm just going to, I think I, have a piece of code over here somewhere in my in my notepad plus plus um just so just to be clear hilo isn't just about tpc or or inheritance right. it's, it it's a general no. thing yes um so what we're going to do here is um i'm going to get rid of the sequence because tpc will automatically uh when you when Hilo. So, See, high low. So this use high low is a pattern that's kind of built into EF Core. It's actually SQL Server specific in this case um, because it uses SQL Server specific stuff to to work. Um, I think it is supported by some other databases too, uh, not SQL Lite because SQL Lite doesn't have sequences. Um, but this will take care of creating an appropriate sequence for you, and it will take care of getting that block of values. So. Um, if this works, because this is why I had to do a custom build, because this didn't work with TPC when I tried it um, first thing today, um, we're going to see a bunch of kind of interesting things going on here. Um, the first is we're going to look at, um, so you see here we created a entity framework high low sequence, right? Um, implicitly. And imp yeah, implicitly. That's that was part of the use high low, right? 
it's, it's starting with one, but it's incrementing by 10. This is how we get a block, right? So basically what we're saying is we want, we're going to get a block of 10 values at once. And you can configure this. You can say, give me a hundred or whatever. Um, and then you'll also notice that none of the, uh, the IDs are not marked as store generated in the store. There's no default constraint. There's no identity on there. Um, as far as the database is concerned, these are explicitly specified key values because EF is the one that's going to take care of that. Okay, so that's the DDL. Okay, now what happens when we actually do an insert uh, here? Um, let me find the right yeah, it's thing. There. It's there. The select uh, next value. Uh, yes, up, up right. Top. So here we have, a, we've, we've executed a command here to basically get the next value. So essentially, it, conceptually, this is getting a block of 10 values. In reality, it just returns you the next value in the sequence so you know where the block starts. And then, you know, the next time you do it, it gets, it's incremented by 10, so you get the next value. But conceptually, this is saying, I am requesting, I'm going to use up these 10 ID values. Um, and the thing that happens here is, the, the interesting thing about this is when that happens. Um, and in our code, oh, that's, that's the context. Let me look at the code again. So you'll notice normally when you do add range here, it, this add doesn't access the database, right? You're not doing anything other than tracking these in the in the context, saying these are tracked in the added state. So when you call save changes, then they um, they will be inserted into the database. But um, in this case, when you call add, that's when that that this command is executed on the database to get that block of sequence values because it needs to know the values right now so they can it can put the values into the tracked entities so that we don't get conflicts in the trace tracker we can fix up foreign keys we need to know those things in advance right and then save changes then uses those values that we've got so importantly even though we're adding we're adding four entities here we only get one block of value. So we don't do four round trips. We don't do a round trip every time you call add, because that would be pretty bad, right? So effectively, what we're doing is a round trip for every 10 times you call add by default. So uh, you know, we get a block of 10 values, we use them up. And then when you call add again, and we run out, we get another block of, uh, of 10 values. This is, in fact, why there is um, a add range async method. Mm -hmm. Like people often wonder about this, right? The reason That's we the have only reason, range, right? It's the only reason why add range yeah. is here, because add never normally accesses the database. But if you're using a high low sequence, then in order to not make that a non blocking async operation on the database, the add range async does that. Um, so uh, normally add range using the add or add range async methods is pointless. It doesn't, it's never async. But in this case, it actually is. Um, I'm not going to. I'm not going to keep that there because I haven't actually tested it works. So I suppose it, <laughs> I suppose it would be good to know if this actually breaks, doesn't it? At least we can file a book then. Let's, this should work. If you see any difference in the actual um, in the actual database output, right? Because it's still just going to be yep. the the core. Okay. So, why is this useful then for TPC? Well, I think it's kind of useful for TPC because as we talked about um, the um, you can't use a simple identity column so you've got to use a sequence in some way and this is a way to use a sequence outside of TPC um, outside of um, any of that stuff why would you actually use a high low instead of using something else um, and there's there's really two there's two reasons for that uh, the first reason is because you can get actual database key values before you do inserts. And so this can be useful if you want to avoid having temporary values, um, especially if you've got a GUI application, you're data binding and you want to sell key values, that, that can be useful, right? Um, how useful? I would say minor, but that's one one thing. The second thing, which is where Shai, why Shai really likes it, is because when you actually do uh, an insert where you've got a foreign key constraint, if that foreign key is using a high low, if the ID that the 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 the, princip the primary key that the foreign key references is using a high low, then because you know the actual database value of that 
you don't need to do that round trip to get the value back and then do another insert into the into the dependent table where you put the key value in that you got back in the first one. You know both those values up front, so you can put them in right away. Um, we could run it and look at the, the code for that, but I'm not going to because we're almost out of time. Uh, and I'm not sure I've got, even got it set up right on the right on the right table for it to do that right now, um, because I've got it on the on the. It might be anyway. We, we won't we won't struggle with that right now. Um, I think I think it's also worth pointing out though uh, that well I guess three things. First, if you use something like GUID, which are naturally generated on the client anyway you get the same thing, right? You Because we know the database value up front, you have it if you're doing data binding and you need it, you have it for the update pipeline so it doesn't have to get the value back. And so using something like GUIDs can can do that uh, automatically. And in fact, anything where, you could, you're, where you're explicitly specifying a key value yourself. Now, I wouldn't recommend using string keys, but for example, if you're using string keys and you, you know that the key value is this thing, or if you're using social security numbers and you know that the social security number is unique and you've, you're just setting it explicitly up front, for example, again, don't do that, it's a bad idea. But if you are doing something like that, then again, you don't need that round trip. Um, so that's, that's one point. So second point is, um, high low confuses a lot of people because you end up with um gaps in your in your key generation right so if i request 10 values from the databases as soon as i request them they're gone they can't be used by anything else if i then insert four four entities like i'm doing in this example i'm going to use four of those values right i can't give the other six values back they're gone so my, my application finishes, my request finishes or whatever, those values are gone. The next time somebody requests, they get the next 10 values from the database. And so you end up with IDs 1, 2, 3, and 4, and then a gap. And it starts on 10, 11, or 11, 12, 13, and 14, or whatever, for the next time. And so you end up with this weird looking thing. And that really, we actually had high low as a default in the, in the before we even shipped EFCO in the, in the, in the pre-release versions of 1.0, high low as a default. It really confused people. They got really concerned by this. And people started doing things like using high low, but setting the, the, in, the increment to one, which basically was the worst of everything. Because now when you add, you're doing a round trip in add to get the value and then you do but you're doing it every time you call add so there's like no batching or anything it's like every time you call add you're getting a value and that's terrible so that brings me to my third point which was also my first point which is simplicity and understandability is really great so while high low might save you a round trip in some situations if you're going to confuse everybody and if somebody later on maintaining it's going to say why is there a gap and start reducing that that size down, you know, until it's until it's the degenerate case where you're getting block of one every time. Things can go can go bad pretty quickly. So high low might be useful. I would I would generally recommend not using it and just staying with the simple things. But Shai, you you, you I know some Jeremy said on the chat we should have a cowbell for like triggers. We we need really need to have a cowbell for round trip. Every time Shai says round trips, we'll like ring a bell. Or I should get some sound effects like they do on like radio. Like, ah, yeah, good. Trips or something. Yeah, let's you know? let's upgrade this this show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, do you want to comment, Shai? You said it all. I mean, I I I'd summarize this in in one sentence. Um, if you're using GUIDs or any sort of client generated stuff, you're not concerned. You don't have to care about this. Hilo is about when you want auto incrementing numeric keys, but you still don't want to pay the round trip, the price for, for the perf. That's all it is. It makes auto increment keys just as efficient as GUIDs without being GUIDs. That's basically the idea with, well, with Hilo. They're not just as efficient if we're going to be pedantic. Not, no, no. If we're pedantic, round no. trip to request a block every That's 10 correct. or whatever you said it, right? Yeah. By the way, I consider 10 a bit low. Uh, it is, I, yes. I, 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 I would personally in my application do like maybe 100 or something. But it, of course, this was, you this, know. Like seven years ago or something, we discussed this a lot. And I can't remember I'm why sure it you came did. out as 10. But anyway. Anybody, there, so. using, anybody using this feature is, is you know, we can expect them to also think about this and specify, you know, what, what they want. Uh, I mean, yeah. it also depends. It's also less, for example, there's another place where it can be less useful. For example, if you only ever insert 
one row at a time, one entity at a time, which is actually a very common thing to do. You also don't get any benefit from it. And I think that was some of the, when we were making a default, that was one of the reasons for having a fairly small block size. Because imagine you only insert one at a time and then your request finishes. So you get that block and then it goes away. And then the next time you get another block, but you only ever use one out of it, then you're doing a round trip to get the block and a round trip to do the insert. And so you're still doing two round trips. So again, your mileage may vary, you know, Yes, but um, it can be useful in some situations. So, okay, we've, we're way, way over. So, um, but hopefully this has been useful. And I think uh, Shai has been answering questions in the chat. So sorry if we didn't answer your questions, but um, yeah. Um, it's, Did my best. Been, yeah, hopefully you found this useful and uh, we'll be back again in two weeks with something. I don't know what yet, but we'll be back with something. So. Now I've got to do the thing that Germany normally does and find the goodbye video thing. So mm. uh, it's down here somewhere. Okay, here it is. Okay, so thanks everyone. We'll see you next time.